But when we talk about authority, we're talking about a very huge subject. I mean, where do we start? We can talk about the authority of God. We can talk about the authority of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We could talk about the authority of Scripture or the uh, a particular passage of Scripture or the authority of someone in Scripture that they wield or even the authority that Scripture gives somebody today. Go back and read the genealogies and it drips with the authority of God. So how do we tackle this subject of authority? Well, you do it the same way you eat an elephant. One bite at a time. So go ahead and please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. And we're going to take a few bites out of that subject of authority tonight. Matthew chapter 26 verse 53 says this. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and He will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? Now I really like passages like this because I call them the behind the scenes passages. It's those passages that give us a little bit of a behind the look of the veil of death. It lets us know what's in the spiritual realm a little bit. Not all passages do that. You have passages such as, Thou shalt not steal. Pretty cut and dry. Love your neighbor as yourself. Still cut and dry. But ever so often you get these nuggets where it's revealed to us some information about the spiritual world. From this passage, we know that there are at least 12 legions of angels and more than that. But this passage also begs a question. And that question is this. Did Jesus Christ, the Son of God, did He have the authority to call down 12 legions of angels? Now before you answer too quickly, listen to what I'm asking you. I'm not questioning Christ's ability. The lame walk, the blind see, the unclean lepers are cleaned, the unclean spirits are cast out, and the dead are raised. Anybody that can do all of that and then says, you know what, I can call down 12 legions of angels, I'll believe them. But I'm not questioning that ability. I'm questioning, does he have the authorization to call down 12 legions of angels? You see, in our society, we don't make that distinction much anymore. We think that just because we have the ability to do something, that gives us the authorization to do something. I have the ability to walk out these doors, go to a bar, get drunk, and go home with somebody that's not my wife. I have that ability. But do I have the authority to do that? Well, of course not. I don't have that authority. I have a vow to God. I have a vow to my wife. I have a responsibility to my children to, to create a stable, loving, home environment, peaceful in existence so that they can grow and be nurtured and mature. And I have a responsibility to all of you. Even though I have the ability to do that, it does not mean that I have the authority. So I ask again, when we go back to this, does Christ have the ability or has the authority? And I say no. You want to know why I say he, he doesn't have the authority to do that? It's right there in the passage. Let's read it again. Or do you not think that I cannot now pray to my Father and He will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? Well, why do you got to pray to your Father? To get the authorization. You see, Christ respected the authority of the Father. He understood what His role was and Christ never stepped outside of that authority. Passages, this passage also brings a few other verses to mind. The first one I think about is this, Hebrews 4.15. I think, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was tempted in all points, tempted as we are, yet without sin. A lot of people try to add words to verses, and one of the biggest words they try to add to verses is the word only. I don't see the word only in this verse. He was only tempted in all points as we were tempted. I find that interesting. Also consider 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation is overtaking you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Do you realize that you and me have a huge advantage? Now, this verse says that we are only tempted with things that are common to man. 
That would seem to suggest that there are temptations that are uncommon to man. Temptations that may be so heinous that if we were tempted with them, that we might fall every single time. Or if we gave in to those temptations, they would be so diabolical that the resulting consequence would rip the space-time continuum apart. And God said, no, 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 no. We're not even going to go there. We're just, whatever is common to them is what you're going to tempt them with. We have an advantage. Satan's power to tempt us has been limited. I find great confidence in that. I, found, I find a lot of great joy in that. But my question tonight is, is did Jesus Christ have the same advantage? Or was Satan allowed to bring his full arsenal of temptation against Christ? Tempting him, yes, in all ways, in all points that we are tempted, for sure, yet without sin. But did his temptation go beyond that? Was he tempted with temptations that are not common to us, temptations that we don't have the ability to even perform? And so we go back to our text. When's the last time you ever threatened to call down 12 legions of angels? Anybody? You walk out of the boss's office and then tell you what, the next time I get called to that office, I'm calling 12 legions of angels down and that conversation is going to go a whole lot differently. Anybody ever done that? Well, no, we don't have the ability to do that. But Jesus Christ did. Is this a temptation that is beyond us? Something that we can't do? Can we call down the 12 legions of angels? Hmm. Well, while we're on the subject of temptation, open your Bibles to Matthew 4. We'll begin in verse 1. We call these the three temptations of Christ. I think we label that a little bit erroneously. Do we really think that the devil, who is prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, is only going to stop after three temptations of Christ? He's hinging his entire rebellion on this point in history. If he can get the Son of God to sin, he wins. So do you honestly think after the third one, he goes, oh, shucks, Jesus, you got me. Well, I think Jesus was tempted a lot more ways. And I don't see how Jesus was tempted in all points that I am tempted in just these three. Now, I understand he was tempted with temptations that are common to us, uh, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. I get that. I understand it. But let's look and see the first temptation. Then Jesus was led by, up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Do you realize that Satan is witnessing on the behalf of the Son of God. Do you re realize that Satan just told us that the Son of God has the ability to turn a stone into bread? So he's not questioning Christ's ability. What is he questioning? He's questioning Christ's authority. Do you have the authority to turn this stone into bread? And I know you don't. And are you going to step outside that authority? Are you going to fall back on your deity to do this? Is this a temptation that is really within our abilities? Now, I know hunger is. We can all be tempted with hunger. But when's the last time you ever thought you were walking down a trail somewhere and you went, man, that stone, that'd make a nice sourdough. I think I'll take that back to the truck and I'll turn it in bread. Has anybody ever been tempted to do that? There's always one. <laughs> but do you have the ability, Dylan, to take a stone and turn it to bread? No. no, you do not. Thank you. Thank you. So is that a temptation that's common to us? Can we turn a stone into bread? No, that's not a temptation. That's a temptation that's beyond us. That's something that goes outside of us. But listen to Jesus' answer. You know, Jesus could have said anything he wanted. He could have said something brand new. He could have said something so profound, so wise, that it just really would have knocked that devil's socks right off. And we'd spend thousands of years trying to understand and comprehend the full manifested wisdom of what he says. And you know what he said? It is 
written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You see, Jesus respected the authority of the scriptures. He stood on the authority of the scriptures. And so we spent the last 2,000 years trying to fully comprehend and understand the full manifested wisdom in that simple statement. The second temptation of Christ. Matthew 4, verse 5. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on a, the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Okay? Now, did Jesus have the ability to throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple? Yes, yes he did. So quite, the question here, Satan is not questioning the ability, he's questioning the authority. Is this a temptation that is within our abilities? Yes, yes it is. No matter what, who you are, I can get you up on top of this building. We can do it, we have the mechanical means if necessary. We can even get you off of this building. Right? So it is within our capabilities of this temptation to fulfill it. The devil here, and this is kind of interesting, because the devil here is actually quoting from Psalms 91, verses 11 and 12. We won't read it tonight for the sake of time, but go back and read it, and you will find that Satan is actually pulling that verse, those two verses, out of context. Fine, Jesus, you want to quote scripture to me? Well, here we go. It is written. And he quotes it accurately. I went back and checked. Do you realize that Satan is the only entity of a spiritual nature that ever takes the word of God out of context? God the Father never did it. God the Son never did it. God the Holy Spirit never did it. None of the angels of God ever took the word of God out of context. Even the demons that fell at Jesus' feet never took the word of God out of context. Only the devil. Do you want to know why? One of the things I love about this congregation is this, that we put such an emphasis on context. The elders push context all the time. Mr. Goff pushes context all the time. Going back to the original language, all the teachers, all the members here, we put so much emphasis on the context. I think that's very important, and here's why. Because when I look at this verse, these verses here, I think of another verse. I think of John 8, starting in verse 39. And it says, They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Now Jesus is specifically talking to the Jews here. And Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me. A man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God, Abraham didn't do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we are not born of fornication. We have our father God. And Jesus said to them, if, you, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God now, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my words. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Do you realize that taking the Bible out of context is a deed of the devil? And it worries me because there's a great many people out there that will quote scripture to you, quote it accurately, but take it completely out of context to prove what they want to believe and not what the Bible actually says. And I wonder if they're not doing the deeds of their father, the devil. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll be honest with you. I've done the deeds of the devil for quite many years. That's not a fact I'm proud of. 
But I don't want to do the deeds of the devil anymore. I want to do the deeds of my father, God. That's why context is so very, very important. That's why this congregation, we push it so much. Keep it within the authority of the scripture. I was watching the History Channel a couple years ago, and they, it was one of those scripture programs they have from time to time, have experts come on and, and talk about scripture. And they had a Catholic, I believe it was a, a bishop on, as an authority on scripture. <laughs> and uh, he said that people torture the scriptures until it says what they want it to say. And first off, I thought, well, that's hilarious. Here's a Catholic talking about torture, and the Catholic system that he's a part of actually raised it to a whole new art form. Was, but you know what he said? That it would, what he said is absolutely 100% wrong. He's absolutely wrong. How do you torture a book? How do you torture words on a written page? How do you torture a page? That's just stupid. A correct statement would have been to say, we torture ourselves until the Bible says what we want it to say. In other words, we take scripture out of context, we ignore other scriptures, until we get to where we want to believe. That might have been a true statement. But we don't want to be that way. We want to be truth seekers, and we want to find the truth and do the deeds of our Father, God. And so how, let me catch up here. Okay, so how do we answer contextual errors? The same way Jesus did. Verse 7 of Matthew 4, Jesus said to him, It is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. How do we battle people who, not, who, who do not rightly divide the word of truth, who constantly misuse the scripture or quote scripture to us, in, in, a, in a wrong manner? Well, we use scripture to combat that. The third temptation of Christ. Go to Matthew 4. <clears throat> Matthew 4, 8. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. So, did Jesus have the ability to fall down and worship Satan? Yes. Yes, he did. We know that because he knelt in prayer many times. We have many, many examples of that. But he was praying to God, his Father. So Satan isn't questioning Christ's ability in this temptation. What is he questioning? The authority. Are you authorized to do it? No, you're not authorized to do it. Are you going to still step outside of that authority or not? Is this a temptation that is common to us? Can we bow down and worship Satan? Yeah. Yeah, there's a great many people doing that right now out, outside these walls. <clears throat> but do we, have the, do we have the authority to do that? No. No, of course we don't. And so Christ answers him, and he says, Then Jesus said to him in verse 10, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and ministered to him. Jesus Christ could have said anything he wanted in these three temptations. He had the ability. And when he chose, what he chose to do was to respect and stand on the authority of the scriptures. And when I look at the first temptation of Christ, and I see that I can't turn a stone into bread, that seems to be beyond me, that seems to be a temptation that is not common to man, it makes me wonder, how truly powerful is the word of God? It's not only powerful enough for, to take care of all of the situations that are common to man, but when Jesus is confronted with a situation that's really not common to us, he still stands on the authority of the scripture. How truly powerful is the word of God? Finally, the last point I will make tonight, we already saw where Jesus respected the authority of the Father. We've seen where he respected the authority of scripture. The last one is, is that he respects the authority that he gave his 
disciples. Open your Bibles to Matthew 28, verse 19. We'll start there. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. First thing I want you to notice when we look at this passage, notice there's a, a order to things. First, we are to make disciples. Well, to make a disciple, we have to actually teach. Is that not true? Okay. A, te a taught person then can be baptized if they are obedient to the gospel. And then once that, that, after baptism, it just doesn't stop right there. It's just not ended. Then we have the responsibility teaching them, who's the them there? The, 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 the disciples that, that are created to observe all things that I have commanded. So once we're baptized, we still have a responsibility to learn. We still have a responsibility to teach. We still have a responsibility to continue to learn about God our Father. Why do I say that Jesus respects the authority that he gives his disciples? Well, first off, Jesus gives them the authority right here in Matthew 28. You and I as disciples of Christ have been given authority. Jesus Christ believes in us. He has entrusted the health of the church to us to a certain degree. We have authority and a responsibility that we must carry out. And Christ respects that. Go over to uh, Acts 22. Acts 22 will begin in verse 7. Now this is the conversion of Saul and he would later become Paul the Apostle. There's a parallel account recorded for us in Acts 9. But let's begin reading now in verse 7. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, this is, this is Saul talking, saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Jesus is talking to him. You want to know how I know it's Jesus? It's in red. It's red. <laughs> so I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you persecute. Oh, okay, that's why we know it's Jesus, right? And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid. But they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, arise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of the light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. Did Jesus Christ, the Son of God, have the ability to tell Saul what to do to become a Christian? Yeah, he's talking to him, right? Would everybody agree with that? Okay, now here comes the question. Did Jesus Christ, the Son of God, have the authority to tell Saul? I believe he did. Matthew 28, 18 says this, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. I believe Jesus Christ did have the authority to tell Saul exactly how to become a Christian. Why didn't he? Because Jesus Christ gave that authority to the disciples. He gave that authority to you and me. And as a, as a loving Lord, believing in our capabilities, believing in us, He let us handle the situation. Continue reading with me. In Acts 22, verse 12. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there. In chapter 9, it says that Ananias was a disciple. You can go back and compare that, but he's also a devout man came to me and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up. 
Then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his, of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Jesus could have sent anybody he wanted to up there. He could, have, he could have had Peter go up there, could have had John go up there, could have had any of the apostles go up there, could have told him, could have told Saul himself how to become a Christian. But he used a local disciple to do that. And notice that local disciple, it's not told that he was a preacher. It's not told that he was an elder. It was told that he was a devout man and a disciple. You see, when we become disciples of Christ, we have authority that is invested to us by Jesus Christ himself. He believes in us so much so that he gave us the authority to do these things. But you know what the flip side of that is? Can that authority be removed from an individual? Yeah, it can. Consider King Saul. King Saul was anointed by God through the hand of Samuel to exercise all judgments over all of Israel. <coughs> But King Saul continuously stepped outside of the authority that God gave him. And God finally removed that authority from him, did he not? He did. Can we have that authority removed from us? Well, consider the unprofitable servant in Matthew 25, 30. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I can think of nothing sadder than for us to have our authority removed simply because we didn't exercise the authority that God gave us to preach the gospel, to make disciples, to teach people the word of God, and to constantly step outside of that authority. Can a congregation lose that authority that Christ has invested into it? Sure, sure it can. Consider the church of Ephesus. Go to Revelation 2, 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. You can have a congregation that loses its authority. If every congregation and every member of the Lord's church that's on earth right now if every one of them this second turned into apostasy, would Christ remove the authority of the church that's on earth right now? The church would still continue. God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. The kingdom would continue. But you see, it's our responsibilities as disciples of Christ. It's our responsibility to take that faith that Jesus has put in us and exercise that to be able to present the word of God to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's not just Mr. Goff's responsibility. It's not just the elder's responsibility. It's every local disciple's responsibility. So the challenge for us is, is to one, not step outside the authority that God has given us, and two, make sure that type of thing doesn't happen. Make sure that we give our Lord and Savior no reason to remove the authority that he's entrusted to us as an individual, as a congregation, and as his church. So tonight what I have presented to you is evidence to show that Jesus respects the authority of the Father. I have shown you how he respects the authority of the scriptures. When we went through our Matthew study a couple of months ago, did anybody else pick up on how much new stuff Jesus actually introduced? I didn't pick up on a whole lot of brand new concepts that Christ actually introduced. He spent a vast majority of his time quoting scripture or correcting understanding of scripture. 
We also saw how Jesus respects the authority that he gives his disciples, you and me. The question tonight too is, do we do the same as our Lord and Savior? Do we respect the God of all creation? Do we truly respect the scriptures, not to step outside of its authority, but to stay within it? And do we respect the authority that he's given us and exercise that authority whenever we can? Well, that's the lesson for tonight. I didn't mention a whole lot about how to become a Christian. You got a little bit of it in Saul's conversion. We know that Saul was heard the message. We know that he believed it. If you go back to Acts 9, we see that he prayed for three days. And so that would be a sign of repentance. We know that the Ethiopian eunuch had to confess that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. We understand that Saul was told in Acts 22, 16 to arise and be baptized, calling on the name of the Lord. How do you call upon the name of the Lord? There's a lot of people out there that think that you just call on the name of the Lord. Jesus, save me. And it's done. But there's a process that has to take place. Saul was calling on the name of the Lord with his baptism. And then, as you saw in Matthew 28, we have to continue to learn. We have to continue to teach. We have to continue to grow as a disciple of Christ. As a member of Christ, if there's anything in this list that you saw that, that you see that you're lacking in, repent of that tonight. If there's anything else that, uh, that, that may be causing you to stumble or somebody else to stumble, please repent of that tonight. And if there's some way that we can help you in this congregation, uh, make your request known to us so that we can pray for you, that we can encourage you. And once you come while we stand and sing the invitation song.